Today we are continuing our series called Your Life Full. Come on, how many want to live a full life? Right? We are talking about, uh, last week we were talking about priorities and we talked about the importance of creating margin in your life with your time and uh, with your priorities. If you missed that message, I highly encourage you to go to flfc.church, click on messages and you can clack, hey, clack. You can catch up there. Remember that whatever your life is full of will overflow onto the people and the world around you. Okay? We've, we started last week's message talking about how a lot of people feel a sense of emptiness in their life. And, and I, I guarantee every last one of us can relate to that sentiment. But the reality is there is no true emptiness. Our lives are full of something. It can't be a true void. It's full of something. The question is, what is your life full of? And whatever your life is full of will overflow onto the people and the world around you. Full life is going to overflow. Come on, somebody. I need a little more enthusiasm from you on that. Full life is going to overflow. Right? Full life is going to overflow. We are going to overflow onto the world around us. One of the ways we do that is through strategic partners like Jonathan and Sarah. And uh, remember a few weeks ago, we learned what strategic partners. If you're wondering why we're talking in code a little bit and there's an M word we're avoiding, please come talk to me after service or any of our team. We'll explain that to you. And it's for people's safety around the world. But we're going to overflow onto the world around us. And there are a key way that we do that. We're going to overflow onto the Magic Valley. Do you hear me? Gone are the days where Full Life Family Church is focused on the three acres that this property sits on. That, that's just kind of a default status for any church. It's like, well, here we are. You know, what's within arm's reach around that? I believe God's put a burden on my heart that we need to lift our eyes and look at this entire valley and see that there's a hurting and dying world out there that needs Jesus. So we've made the decision that we are going to overflow. We're going to overflow to places like Kimberly. We're going to overflow to places like Goody, places like Filer, places like Hazleton. I was blown away. Uh, Naomi and I, the other day, we just started to make a list of the cities in the Magic Valley. And it was like, 20 cities in this valley, and most of them do not have a, a, a Pentecostal church, a, a, an Assembly of God church in any way, shape, or form. Most of them don't have a healthy church at all. So we are, are making the choice that we are going to overflow. We are aiming, everybody say aiming. We are aiming to overflow on the world around us. So today we're going to talk about overflowing financially. <laughs> And it's just something that happens, you know, as soon as the preacher mentions finances, like the air gets sucked out of the room. It was like, oh no, I picked this Sunday to come to church. You did. And it was for such a time as this. And I promise you that no matter what your opinion is regarding churches and finances, God has you here for a very specific reason. So you may hate it right now, but by the end of the service, you may still hate it, but I believe a lot of you are going to love it. <laughs> so we're going to tap into what God's word says about being financially full. Let's face it. Few things in our world help uh, create a sense of emptiness for us like the area of finances, right? I mean, we can have a premonition of emptiness when it comes to destiny and purpose and, and vocation and all these things. And listen, if you're in, in that season right now, remember that everybody experiences that at some point or another. But when it comes to our finances, there's no ambiguity about it. I mean, there are just times where we've got more month than money and we do not have resources. And it's, it's, it's not a matter of premonition. It is a matter of fact that we are out of money and we feel that lack and that need, okay? So there's a principle we're going to apply from the word of God today. And when you get this principle right, it will impact far more than just your finances or your money. It will impact every area of your life. You see, I think it's pretty safe to say that most people fall into one of three categories. They fall into this Financial emptiness category. 
Maybe there's some of you in this category today that you look in your, page, your, your checking account and you realize, yeah, there's nothing there. I, I got more bills than I have resources to meet those needs with. You're just like, this is a state of reality. My life is in financial emptiness. And when the preacher's talking about impacting the world around you, reaching out to other parts of the world, supporting missionaries, supporting kingdom builders, supporting the church, you're like, well, that golly gee whiz, that would be nice. But there's nothing but moths coming out of my wallet. You're in a place where your life cannot, your finances can't overflow to the world around you because what the current reality is, is emptiness. There's some people here today, you're in a place of occasional uh, overflow. It's not, it's not routine. It's not a habit in your life. But every once in a while, maybe when, when the preacher puts up a, a picture of a starving child or there's a need that you find compelling, every once in a while, you'll dig deep, you'll reach in, and you'll give. And in those moments, your finances are overflowing to the world around you. And then there's this other group here of consistent overflow. We're on the regular on the day in and day out, your finances are overflowing and impacting the world around you. Now let me help you understand something. You were not born in one of these chairs. You didn't come out of the womb in financial need. You may have been born to a financially impoverished family, but you were not born. God did not assign you to one of these chairs, and that's just your lot in life. The reality is you can move (laughs) from one chair to another. Did you know that the majority, the vast majority of millionaires in this country have never made over $100,000 in the form of a salary? The vast majority of them. It doesn't work that way. So if you are in, a, in the place of emptiness, you can move. The principle we want you to apply in your life will do so much more than change your financial situation. It will cause your entire life to overflow. The Bible has a lot to say about how we steward our money. Did you know that? Did you know that the Bible talks more about finance? finances than it does about heaven and hell combined. The Bible talks a lot about resources. Now, I want you to write this down. If, you, if you're not a note taker, today's a great day for you to become a note taker. Grab a piece of paper. Get out the note app on your phone. Go to our website and click on the message notes, and you can take notes right there. But I want you to write this down. You cannot have God's promises over your money until you practice God's principles with your money. Let me say that again. You cannot have God's promises over your money until you practice God's principles with your money. Listen, everybody wants to be blessed, right? (laughs) I have never met anybody, no one's ever, not one time, came up to me and said, you know what, Pastor, we have too much financial blessing. I need you to pray to get God to stop. That, That has never happened. But you know what, we have prayed for hundreds and hundreds of people for financial victory, financial breakthrough, financial rescue in their life. In fact, many times when we pray just, you know, through our time of worship, we'll, we'll break it up into three categories, you know, physical healing, relational healing, and finances. That's how common it is that people have financial needs and they're bringing those needs to God. Now listen, if you're in a place where you have financial need, Whether you've lost a job, you're just in uh, some kind of a hardship, pray. That is a good thing to do. I'm not trying to discourage you from bringing that to prayer, but I need you to understand that we can pray for you, but we do not have special access to God that's going to do some kind of miracle in your life where it's going to override this principle where you're going to get a miracle breakthrough in a disobedient lifestyle. It's not going to happen. In fact, if you've been around long enough, you've probably heard that when I'm praying for people to have financial breakthrough, often the way I pray is that they will have a miracle level of obedience in in their finances. Because I know, no matter what we pray, until you respond to God in faith and you walk in covenant with him, you're not going to see any real major change in the long run. 
God can do whatever he wants to do. God's bailed me out many times in a lot of different ways. And I'm sure there's a lot of you would say the same thing. But God is a covenant God. And he walks in covenant with people who choose to walk in covenant with him. The blessings of God are equally available to everyone who chooses to step into covenant with him. Because God is a covenant God. How many of you love the promises of God? Right? Come on, you should. They're good. And, and we could list off and you guys would feel so good and we'd be high-fiving each other and we'd be smiling. Because some of you, because I start talking about finances, you're not smiling anymore. But if we were talking about the promises of God, we'd all be smiling and say, yeah, yeah. But let me tell you something we often forget is that all of the promises of God are conditional. Did you hear me just then? Not some of them. Not a lot of them, all of the promises of God are conditional. And I want you to hone in on a word that you need to start seeing everywhere. You, that it needs to jump out for you when you see it in your Bible because it's everywhere. It's the word if. It's a powerful word. You see, we, I'm telling just something about our culture today. We like, we like to entertain the promises of God absent from the word If. But the Bible is full of it. The Bible over and over again where God says, if you do this, then I will do this. Right? The promises of God are conditional. Now, I want to introduce you to a word today. It, it's, it might be an uncomfortable word for some of you. I guarantee you some of you won't like it. I'm, a lot of people today misunderstand it, don't really understand what it means. But it's a good word. It's a Bible word. It's a covenant word. And that word is tithe. Okay? Tithe. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you can go on YouTube right now. You can, you know, you know, unlearn the lies and, you know, the lies of the tithe. It, it always kills me that whenever somebody disagrees with biblical tithing, the other side has to be a lie. I'm like, why can't it just be a difference of opinion, a difference of perspective? It's always a lie. I get it. It's clickbait. They're just saying that so that you'll click on it. And the sad thing is, is Christians will latch on to it because they want it to be a lie. Because if, if that's a lie, then I'm not accountable to it. So, I want you to disregard everything that I'm going to say about the tithe. Now, I want you to disregard all the things that other people say about it. What I want you to apply to your life today is what the Bible says about the tithe. And if you can read the Word of God and come away that that's not something that God wants for your life, well, then don't do it. You know, you roll the dice the way you want to roll. But if you will be objective about it and see that that's something God has created to bless you, not to take something from you, then I think you'll be set free. Okay, so let's, we're going to read a lot of scripture today because I don't want you to get the idea that this is just my opinion or just my, uh, you know, my spiritual upbringing. This is what the word of God says. So let's go to Genesis chapter 14, verse 19, and it says this. Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. Blessed be Abram. I said, did that in the first service. It's not Abraham, it's Abram. It'd be Abraham later. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has defeated your enemies. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Now, you need to understand this. The word tithe is not a spiritual word that means offering. The word tithe simply means 10%. I've heard people say before, well, I tithe, but I only tithe 5%. No, you don't. I don't know what the word for 5% is, but it's not tithe. You, you, you fifth. <laughs> Okay, which is great. I think that's better than nothing, but that's not walking in obedience because God said to tithe. A tithe simply means 10%. That's what it means. There's nothing mystical about it. Okay, so it's important for you to understand that this story about Abram and Melchizedek is before the law. A lot of people, the, 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 probably the biggest pushback that I hear from modern Christians is, Jeremy, that's all well and good, but tithing is Old covenant, we're under the new covenant, so we've been set free. Listen, you understand that 
This is before the law. Tithing existed before the law, but then it's affirmed within the law. Listen to this. This is Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. This is in the Levitical law. Listen to this. One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, what's that say? Belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. Listen, if you don't hear anything else that I say to you today, you need to catch this. You have a tithe. That, that, that's not a matter of if. It exists whether you give it to the Lord or not. What you need to see is that the word of God teaches us is it already belongs to the Lord. The question is, are you going to return it to him or are you going to steal it? Those are our options. And it must be set apart as holy. Do you know what holy means? Because church folk get weird about the word Holy. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, you ever notice how people will talk weirder when they're witnessing to people about Jesus? You know, they could be totally normal one second, and then it's like something about church. Whoa, brother, let me share with you about my faith. You know, and it's just like, what, what, what happened to you? Why did you get weird? Can we, can we be real? And, and we do the same thing with the word holy. The word holy doesn't mean mystical or mythical or hyper-spiritual. What it means is set apart. The word holy simply means set apart. So what Leviticus is teaching is that first 10% that we all get, if you get any increase whatsoever from any source whatsoever, you have a 10% of that. It, it exists no matter what you do with it. But what, what Leviticus is teaching us is that first 10%, it belongs to God, and what he wants you to do is to set it apart because it's holy. Let's keep going. Deuteronomy 14, 23. Bring this tithe to the designated place of worship, the place the Lord your God chooses for his name to be honored, and eat it there in his presence. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and firstborn males of your flocks and herds. Now listen, what that is talking about is the economical system that they lived under. We don't we don't have an economy that's based on olive oil, new wine, and firstborn males of our flocks. We have an economic system that we use money, right? And if you don't believe me, you know, the next time your goat has a baby goat, try to buy groceries with that and, and see how that works for you. Probably not going to go too well. But so when we bring the tithe to the place of worship, look what it says. Doing this will teach you, to, teach you always to fear the Lord your God. Listen, in my experience, almost always when you see a church-going person who has no fear of God, has no reverence for God, is almost always, almost without fail, it's because they do not honor God in the area of their tithe. And, and we have this warped sense of attitude about it. What we do is like, well, when I learn it, then I'll do it. But God, he wants your heart. He wants your obedience. It's when you do it then you'll learn it, and you will learn to fear the Lord your God. I love this because wherever people are tithing, there's a greater reverence for the Lord your God. I love Full Life Family Church because we have a very high percentage of tithers in this church and compared to the national average. And it's very sad. Actually, nationally speaking, the, the number of people who claim to be a Christian who actually obey God in the area of tithing is very, very sh shockingly low. But it's much higher than that in this church, and I'm grateful for that. So look at Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you, and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Come on, how many of you see that as good news? Come on. And I love this. I love this. It says, try it. Put me to the test. Did you know, <coughs> excuse me, that's the only place in Scripture where God says to put him to the test in other words, he's saying, I double dog dare you to do it. Nay, I triple dog dare you <laughs> to do it. Look at this, I love this verse. One of my favorites, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8 says, Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them. 
Remember, a lot of people, their pushback is, well, that's Old Covenant, it's Old Testament. Here we are in the New Testament in Hebrews, and he's saying, here, when you tithe, when you, like, you know, a lot of you, most of you in our church actually will give through our website. But whether you're giving through the website or whether you're putting it in the offering on the way out or you're using one of the deposit boxes that are all over the building, however you do it, mortal men receive that and account for that and are steward over that. But something spiritual happens. Here, mortals receive it, but there, God receives it. There, receives it. In heaven, God receives your physical act as heavenly worship. Oh, come on, that's powerful. That is so good. You know, it, it, in a lot of ways, how we treat the offering is a much greater indication of our heart towards God than our time of worship. I mean, if we're all out, tears running, hands up, and we're worshiping God, but we don't trust God with our money, then there's something there we're holding back from God. Listen, even Jesus affirms the tithe in the New Testament. Again, a lot of people say, well, Jesus never talked about the tithe. That's not true at all. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes. So you need to highlight that and underline. You need to back up, back that up, back up the tape. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. The tithe is important, but it is not everything. Listen, the tithe was instituted before the law. We read a few moments ago about Abram tithing to Melchizedek. But, you know, we can go all the way back to the, to the very beginning. Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve had two boys, Cain and Abel. And did you know what the first family feud recorded in the Bible was about? It was about offering. Did you hear me? You see, one of them brought their first and their best. It's Genesis chapter 4. You can read it. One of them brought their first and their best, and God received it. The other brought leftovers and less than perfect. It was just, well, whatever they had left, and God did not receive it. And so he got jealous and killed his brother. And yet God had said, if you would just do what is right, you too would be accepted. Listen, all New Testament givers should rise to the tithe. Did you hear me? All New Testament givers should rise to the level of the tithe. Even old covenant believers, listen to this, even, the, even in the old covenant, they would say that they would boldly declare things like, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen them begging for bread. Now, how many of you understand that God does not love our forefathers more than he loves us? He's not making promises to them that do not also apply to us. So if he's going to bless and lift up them, then the promises apply to us. Amen? But listen, the devil wants to distract us. We have an enemy and he's out to get you. And I guarantee you there's some people you're struggling with this right now. Some people are like, if I could get up and get out of here, I would. I just don't want to make a scene. There are people that, and listen, the people who don't want to hear this are almost always the people that need to hear it the most. You know, they're the people that say, well, that church just wants my money. Listen, Unless this is your first day, you should be able to testify that we don't talk like this every single week. We don't even bring it up. We're probably one of the least offering mentioning churches that you could go to in our culture today. You know, most churches, they have that whole time in their service that all talks about the offering and puts pressure on people to give. We don't. At the end of every service, we put a slide up and we tell you how to give, but it's up to you whether or not you're going to give. But there's this premonition that the world has that the church just wants your money, and yet they would never, ever say that about any other organization on the face of the earth. Right? Nobody goes to, to the grocery store and is shocked that we have to pay a bill. You might be shocked at what the bill is, like I was just a couple days ago, but you're not shocked that they expect. You don't go to the, you don't go to the store manager and say, well, you just want my money. You just want my money. 
You know, no, but we don't do that to any place else. We don't get a haircut and be like, what? You just want my money. We, we just don't do that. We don't go to the place we buy clothes. We don't even get on Amazon and go, what? Man, Amazon just wants my money. But yet we'll sit in the church. We'll receive what we would even say is the greatest gift that we can receive, the greatest encouragement, the greatest life instruction, and then be have the audacity to say, well, the church just wants our money. Listen, there's good news for all of us today. Look at Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This is Jesus talking after he'd been in the wilderness and had been resisted the temptation of the devil. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim. What's that? Good news to the who? To the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. There is good news for all of us today. So I want to give you some things for you to take with you today. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. It's number one, financial overflow is within your reach. Some of you are probably like, yeah, right, preacher. But listen, financial overflow is absolutely within your reach. Listen, everybody who, was, who has ever become a consistent giver, who consistently impacts the world around them, and their, over, their finances overflow into the kingdom. They started as an occasional, every once in a while. That's where they started. So if you've been in this chair, you can move over to that occasional. And if you're in this place where you give occasionally, you can move over to where you're Finances impact the kingdom on a regular basis. God wants to call you to a place where your life impacts the kingdom on a regular basis. You see, the tithe is a trust issue. When we tithe, we tell God we believe he can do more with the 90 we have left, the 90% we have left, than the 100% we have to our own devices. And all you got to do is ask someone who tithes faithfully. They will tell you, absolutely, that's the truth. Tithing tells God you believe he can do more with 90 than we can do with 100. It's a stewardship issue. Do you know that we're commanded in Scripture to give offerings, but we don't give the tithe. Hear me now. We return it. Okay, we give tithes. So anything above that 10%, that's just you being generous and benevolent. A lot of you give way more than 10%. But that first 10%, that is returned to God. Like I said earlier, and I, I know that's a bit of a provocative statement, there's only two things you can do with the tithe. You all have one. We all have one. We can either return it to God, set it apart as holy, or we can steal it. Those are the two options. And if you think I'm being too strong in my language about that, read all of Malachi chapter 3, and you tell me if I'm being stronger than what God says. We're supposed to return the tithe. And I think that's important. You see, Pastor Naomi gave me these 10 $1 bills before the service. I asked for $100 bills, but she's cheap. She only gave me $10 bills. Now, I, I like this because it, it's easy math, and I need easy math. So who's with me? Who needs easy math? Okay, so if I've, got, if I've got 10 $1 bills, how much of this is a tithe? I'm sorry, in my good ear. One. So we all agree that $1 would be a tithe. Okay, good. So I like that because I can handle the math. But let me ask you a question. Which one is the tithe? the first one. It's the first one. And listen, even a lot of Christians who tithe on a regular basis today don't understand this principle. It's not meant to be just 10%, but the first 10%. And the reason that this is, the reason this is important is because that first 10% is holy. It's not just a 10%. It's holy. It's meant to be set apart. Listen, Naomi and I, we tithe just like all of you. 
You know, some people have this perception that when you give in the offering, it goes right into our bank account. <laughs> It, that, that's not how it works. That, you know, we get paid a salary just like anybody else does. That's set by our board, and it's, there's you know, a great deal of accountability there. And once we receive our income, just like you, we go on to Planning Center, just like you. We go into the church app. We go on the church website, just like you, and we make the choice to honor God with the first 10% of our increase. And it's important to us because we don't want anything else to get our first. Did you hear me? We don't want the truck payment to get our first. We don't want the house payment to get our first. We don't want our eating out to get our first. We want God to get the very first of our increase because God honors faith that puts him first. Did you hear me? Let me say that again. God honors faith that puts him first. God honors faith that puts him first. And with all the different things, the car payments and the the house payments and all the things that can come up in our life, it's very easy for us to, without even meaning to, to find ourselves in a position where we actually honor everything else more than we honor God. Did you hear me? It's easy to find ourselves in a position where we're actually honoring everything else before we honor God. You see, the tithe lifts us out of an occasional giving rhythm. And when we tithe, we start impacting the kingdom every single time we get paid. Oh, man, that's huge. And I just love that. I love that we have online giving because you don't, I mean, I Okay, I, I get it. Now, some people may be like, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. I want to come to the church and I want to, I want to you know, present it. I think that's great. I love that. But I think there's something really cool. You know, like a lot of people get paid on like first and 15th intervals like that. At that moment, whether it's a Sunday or a Wednesday or Thursday afternoon, that in that moment, you can have a worship encounter with God that's more sincere and more powerful than what you may have when you're in this building. Because when we tithe, we impact the kingdom every time we get paid. I'm telling you, it's within your reach. Now, here's the thing. I maybe hear this more than any other thing. It's, Pastor, do we have to tithe? Or... The people who get a little bolder, they've seen a few more YouTube videos that are incorrect. They say, we do not, we're not required to tithe. Let me tell you something. I completely agree with that statement. So if you're already preparing your defense and you're going to come up to me in the lobby afterwards, let me tell you something. I already agree. You do not have to tithe. Listen to this. We're going to put it on the screen. The tithe is not an obligation. It is an invitation to a blessed life. It's not an obligation. If you choose not to tithe, it doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean you're, you know, God's angry with you. But it does mean you've chosen not to walk in covenant with him in the area of your finances. It means that you think you can do more with that 100% than God could do blessing the 90%. So it's not an obligation. It's an invitation to a blessed life. Listen, tithing is not just a trust issue or a stewardship issue. It's also a discipleship issue. We cannot be spiritually free at the same time we're being financially shackled. Amen? Look at this. This verse, if anything else, will change your heart. Look, it's Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Your heart is connected to your resource. Did you hear me? Your heart is connected to your resource. That is why so many Christians care more about the world than they do about the kingdom. Why? Because the car payments come first. The 17th Little League thing for our kids come first. So I love our kids. 
And I think it's great that we do things for our kids, but if we can't afford to honor God because we're doing so much with our kids, then what we're doing is we're teaching our kids that God's not first in our life, they are. And if we teach our kids that they're more important to us than God, then guess who's going to be more important to them than God? They will be. When they grow up, they will, they will see themselves as being more important than God. The best thing we can do for our families is demonstrate that God is more important than anything else. Listen, if God gets the last, then God is also getting the least from us. That's why tithing will change your heart. You can give your heart to the kingdom of God by starting the practice of tithing. Okay, so here's some things about the tithe. Let me do this. It's going to go really quick. Number one, it provides for God's house. That's how the church is funded. I, we've had people say, well, listen, this is no joke. It's funny, totally off the rails here. But we've, we often get people who speed through the parking lot. We've had people ram the gates and the chains and stuff out there because people are crazy. But I was out there one day, and I'm like, slow down. And they gave me the finger, <laughs> and they said, my taxes pay for this. This is public property. And I'm like, wow, everything you just said was wrong. Every word in that sentence was wrong because, number one, they didn't look like they've ever paid a tax in their life unless you count the sales tax on cigarettes or something. But, and number two, the church is not funded with tax money. So I, and it's, it's weird to me that people don't understand it, but not, the government does not supplement. The government does not give us one penny. The church exists. The chair you're sitting on, the, the lovely carpet that has served us for so many years, um, <laughs> All of this was paid for by somebody else, honoring, somebody else honoring God in the area of tithes and offering. That's how it happens. That's what it is. So it provides for God's house. Number two, it tells God that I trust him. It is a visible sign of an invisible faith. Number three, it's, it creates a space in my life for God to fill. Four, it reminds me that I am not my source. Five, it connects my money to an eternal and kingdom purpose. Six, it, it gives my job eternal significance. If you hate your job, man, you should be a tither. Man, because it gives that job eternal significance. It transforms my money into a seed. It breaks greed off of my heart. It lets everything else in my life know that God is first. It brings covenant blessing on everything else that I have. And it supersedes me and leads to a generational blessing. Let me, t- let me ask you a question. Aren't you glad? that there's not some super secret method you got to figure out to get God's blessing. Let me tell you something. There's no shortage of people selling books and, and you know, programs teaching you how to release the blessing of God in your life. You know, because you got to pray just the right way. you got to stand on one foot, close one eye, and look just right and say the words just the right way. And then and only then can you unlock God's blessing. There are people trying to teach you how to, quote, unlock the blessing in your life. Listen, it's not complicated. There's no secret to it. There's no favoritism attached to it. It, All the promises of God come down, including this one, come down to one simple word, and that word is obedience. Whether we like it or not, that's the reality. All right, number two, overflowing in our finances is meant to change the world. How many of you know that the church is known to be greedy? Come on, a lot of people have that perception. The church just wants your money. A lot of people, maybe not you, because you guys are awesome and you're so pretty. (laughs) But a lot of people, they think the church is greedy. And the church is greedy, but not in the way you think. We're greedy in our worship. We worship the one true God and we worship him only. We're greedy in that sense. We're not going to worship any other God. Absolutely, we're not going to budge. You know, when I see those coexist stickers, I'm like, I will exist, but there's only one God. There's the cross and a whole bunch of fictitious symbols that are man-made and represent lies. I love those people. I'm not going to judge those people. I'm not going to be harsh to those people. But the idea that we're going to accept other gods, it's it's not possible. We're greedy in our worship. We're greedy in our focus. 
and that we believe that, that we are absolutely laser focused that our mission is to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all the ends of the earth. We're going to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what we're greedy in that focus. We're not taking on a whole lot of other focuses. We are greedy in that focus to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We're greedy in our sexuality. <laughs> Because we believe that sex is supposed to be between one man and one woman in the institution of marriage. That's what we believe. We're greedy in that. Single ladies, you need to be greedy in your sexuality. Single men, you need to honor the greediness in those ladies. We need to be greedy in our sexuality because we're honoring God. But you know what? There's one thing that the church is not greedy with and never has been. It's our money. The church has never been greedy with money. Nothing has impacted the world like the local church. Nothing. You can point to any area of help in the world, and the church has done more by over a thousand percent than anybody else. We've done more to feed the homeless. We've done more to house the homeless. We've done more to feed the hungry. We've done more to create health care. I mean, have you ever wondered why virtually every hospital in the land has a sink in front of it? It's because they were founded by Christians. We've done more in the area of education. You know, almost every Ivy League school in existence today was founded as a Bible college. It's the church that's reaching around the world. It's the church that's digging wells. It's the church that's putting shoes on children in third world countries. It's the church that's doing more. Why? Because we may be greedy in a lot of ways, but what we've never been is greedy in our money. It's in our heritage to be a people who use our money to impact the world for the glory of God. Listen, even Paul talks about this. He said in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in the gracious act of giving. That's giving to and through the church. Listen, if you're struggling this, here's my advice to you today. Is I want you to, to go and talk to someone who tithes. Just go ask them. Just ask them. Because let me tell you something. What I've, I tried to do the math the other day, but it's like 37 years I've been in church. And I started serving in ministry just a few years after that. So we're definitely close to, it's not a dishonest thing for me to say, that I've been serving in ministry for around 35 years. I've met a lot of church folk in that amount of time. And you know what I've never, ever heard one time in 35 years? Never heard anybody say, you know what the worst thing I ever did financially? Starting to tithe. This is the worst thing I ever did. You know, the worst thing I ever did was starting to be given be generous and give to programs like kingdom builders and missionaries and, and help the world around me. I've never, ever, ever heard people tell stories like that. But I've heard story after story after story after story of people who say, you know what, I started to trust God and honor him with the first 10% of my increase. And something changed on the inside. I'm telling you, I've seen a lot of first-time tithers who struggle. I mean, it's like a white-knuckle grip. They can't, just can't let go of it. But I tell you what, after it's happened, and after you experience the goodness of God, it's not that. You can't wait. I mean, it's just like in your hand. You can't wait to give it to God because something changes on the inside. I remember a particular person we had in the church who... They got saved, they came to the church, and <laughs> they, just, I, they just wrestled so hard with the tithe. Good person, kind of standoffish and shy. And then we watched over time, and they started to tithe, and it was like a whole new person came out this shy, reserved person that didn't want to overcommit, you know, they're always scared to commit. They became one of the most outgoing, most helpful people that just couldn't stop serving in the house of God. Why? Because God changed them on the inside. God says, test me in this. 
I think some of you need to put God to the test. And listen, let me ask you a question. What do you think the Bible says? about? What do you think God's trying to teach us in the word of God? Listen, did you know this? That the Bible speaks of loving other people 714 times. The Bible speaks of prayer 371 times. The Bible speaks of believing 272 times. But the Bible talks about giving 2,152 times. Listen, God doesn't need your money. He's after your heart. And he knows that your heart is attached to your money. God doesn't need anything from you. Sugar lump, I'm telling you. Nobody in here has so much that the church needs you to respond. Jesus said, this is my church. It's established on the rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it unless Johnny doesn't tithe. False. Listen, there may be people here, you, you're angry, you're frustrated that I'm talking about this. You're like, I've heard it enough from these preachers. And you say, I don't care what happens, I'm not going to tithe. That's fine. I get it. I hear you. The church has gone on for thousands of years, and it will continue on <laughs> with or without your tithe. <laughs> Amen? But this is what I don't want you to miss. It may continue on without your tithe, but you will miss out on something. Because let me tell you something. If you don't hear anything else I say to you, hear this. God wants more for you than he wants from you. He wants to get more to you than out of you. He doesn't need anything from you. He wants to get something to you. And if you've got a white knuckle grip around your finances and you've got a guardrail around your heart that he can't penetrate until you get to the place where you trust him with your finances. And that leads to number three. Overflow in our finances starts with a change in us. It starts with a change in us. Listen, last week we talked about our priorities and our time, and we said one of the healthiest things we have to do is create margin. We need to have margin. Margin is a good thing for our life. And some of us have fallen into a trap of so much debt and so many payments that we couldn't tithe if we wanted to. I mean, think about it. If by the time you get 10... There's already five or six of these already spoken for. And it's really hard to be generous when you have nothing left. But let's be real. Statistically, there are people in this room, by the time you get 10, somebody else has already claimed 12. Statistically speaking, a lot of people in this country spend more than they make. And it's really hard to honor God when we have no margin. See, the reality is we're all tithing. Just some of us are tithing to MasterCard. Some of us are tithing to Discover Card. Some of us are tithing to a car payment. Some of us are tithing to a house payment. We're so buried in our obligations that we couldn't honor God even if we wanted to. If that's you, we want to offer you something today. Because just like God, we want more for you than from you. We're not here to to make your life more difficult. We're not here to make you feel bad and be like, well, Pastor Jeremy, I don't even have enough to make ends meet, but now you want me to give 10% that I don't have to give. Listen, that's not our message today. We want more for you than from you. So we want to offer you a program. It's called Ramsey Plus. Okay? This is Tithe Challenge Sunday. And this is my challenge for you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Jeremy, I would love to honor God with my tithe. I just can't. I am upside down. I I can't make ends meet then we want to pay for this program for you. It's $59.99, and our church will pay for you to go through this program to give you the opportunity to get your finances in order because we want more for you than from you. Come on, did you hear me, church? 
we want more for you than from you. As you came in today, you should have got one of the cards that has a QR code. The QR code is on the screen. You can go to flfc.church. You can find Tithe Challenge on the homepage. You can click give, and below that, you'll see the Tithe Challenge. In other words, there's a lot of ways that you can get to this as discreetly as you'd like to. (laughs) Because I love you. And I'm going to tell you something. I know I'm going over, but we have chili, so just relax. (laughs) Naomi and I have been there. Shoot. (laughs) We've been there. I told this story years ago, and you'll just have to forgive me because I'm going to take some more time. It's my prerogative. (laughs) We were serving in ministry, serving in the church, preaching, you know, as often as I did in those days, I was a lead pastor, was not a lead pastor. About the time we were having our first baby, and let me tell you something, life was expensive. And we sat down to do our finances and we realized we'd not been honoring God with our tithe. We just hadn't been doing it. We'd just gotten out of the habit. We felt the pressure What started as a week turned into a couple weeks, which turned into a month, which turned into a few months. And I don't know how you would feel about that, but I was just destroyed. I mean, it still makes me emotional now. And I was like, this this cannot be. This isn't who we are. So I can tell, I can remember so clearly what, what we did. I told him, it was, it was already late at night, like say 11 o'clock. I said, well, why don't you go to bed? I'm just going to stay up and pray and think about this for a little bit. I already knew what I was going to do. I just didn't want her to see it. She went to bed. This is a true story. Just wave your hand if it's a true story. Yeah, okay. When she went to bed, I loaded my car with everything in my house that I thought I could sell. I'm not telling you to go do this. I'm just telling you my story, Okay. I had two really nice guitars. They were kind of like dream guitars at that point in my life. They weren't, you know, it was just, it was the nicest guitars I'd ever owned. I had a, a really cool guitar effects thing. So if you don't know what that is, I'll just tell you, it was $1,000. It was expensive. That's what you need to know. I had a set of golf clubs. We had a TV. This was before the days of the flat TVs you can carry with one hand. It was a TV you're like... <laughs> That went in the car. My golf clubs went in the car. The guitars went in the car. The processor went in the guitar. I had a little Ford Explorer Sport, and it was completely filled. I could not get anything else in the car. In the morning, before she got up, I went to a pawn shop, hawked it all. The amount of money I got for our possessions was about $10, give or take. I don't really remember that detail. It was a little, bit of, a little bit more than the amount we had stolen from God over the months we had not been tithing. And I, tell, I, I, I was mad because the stuff was worth way more than that, right? You know, you're not going to get good money at a pawn shop. And I took that money and I sat down with my pastor the next day, later that day, and I said, I am so sorry that we haven't been tithing and I gave that money to him. And I asked God to forgive us. I asked him to forgive us. I asked this fly to go away. But do you know what happened? It is funny. I, when I've told the story before, I was much more prepared. It didn't happen the next week, but over the next few years, we had literally given to us everything that I had sold at a whole nother level. If you know me and my golf skill, you know that I'm worthy of a $99 set of golf clubs. But do you know that I have in my possession a $2,000 set of golf clubs? Somebody just gave it to me. You know, it's, well, I feel stupid because the day that those were given to me, I didn't even realize it. 
I didn't see God fulfilling his promise. I have a $4,000 guitar. I can tell you that because I didn't buy it. Somebody gave it to me. It was a gift. God has given me back everything. Our first TV that you didn't have to carry like this. (laughs) The first one we got, it was a 55-inch TV, 3D Right? They don't even do that anymore. So I was like, yeah, this is stupid. But back then it was like the coolest thing, right? It was given to us. Every single, I mean 100%, everything that I put in that car and gave back to God said, God, I repent. God gave it back to us to a whole nother level. And I'm ashamed to admit it was years later. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everything that we sacrificed to honor God, God gave it back to us for free on a whole nother level. So all that to say is I know what it's like. And if you're struggling financially, we want more for you than from you. You go on there, you have to fill out your thing, you'll follow the form, you sign up for a 14-day free trial, then the church will reimburse you the cost of this program. It's $59.99, and we will pay for it. The church wants to give more to you than it takes from you. We want to bless you. We want to see you have some margin in your life. But for some of you, it's not about margin. It's just about priority. So we want to give you the opportunity to take the tithe challenge. Okay, so you'll see up on the screen right now, we have a book that we'd like to give away. So if you're at day, you say, I've got the margin. I just have never made it a priority to put God first in the area of tithe. You sign up for this 90-day challenge. We're going to give you the book, The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. It's a book we've taught out of here at this church before. We're going to give that to you. We'll send it to you, whether you want a, uh, an e-book or paperback or hardcover, whatever you want, uh, whatever the options are. I don't remember what they are. But you'll see the options when you go on there. And then we're also, we're going to pray with you and follow up with you for 90 days. Now, that does not mean that we're going to harass you for 90 days, I promise. What that means is we're going to send you some encouragement. We're going to send you some emails. We're going to celebrate with you for the next 90 days as you take this tithe challenge. And if you get to that.